Okay, Rajiv, you can get started. Yes, sir. Is uh, visible? Right? Yes, I can see it. Yes. So, good afternoon, one and all. Uh, uh, we, our group will be presenting uh, the paper, Last Level Side Channel Attacks Are Practical. Uh, so, before getting into the attack, let's uh, look into the cache hierarchy. Uh, so, the cache contains the L1, L2 and the LLC level. L1 and L2 are private to each cache, whereas the LLC is uh, common to all cores. Hence, it is possible that there could be a side channel attack uh, on that particular level. So, today we will be looking into one of the possible side channel attacks called the conflict based attack. So, what happens in the attack is uh, the attacker fills the cache sets. Uh, when the victim makes an access, the attacker's line gets evicted. And uh, due to this uh, eviction, uh, when the attacker re-accesses his own lines, he will be able to figure out that the A0 got evicted. And using this uh, hit and miss, he will be able to figure out the victim's access pattern. So, uh, the main goal of uh, today's presentation will be uh, looking into prime probe, which is a type of a conflict-based attack. So, the prime probe consists of the following steps. First step is to construct an eviction set. Then, in the prime stage, the attacker fills the sets used by the fills the sets used by a victim with known lines. Then wait for the victim to make an access to those sets. Then once the victim makes an access, access in the probe stage, the attacker re-accesses those sets to figure out which lines have been evicted by the victim. Using this, the attacker can figure out the victim's access pattern. So now let's see what an eviction set is and uh, how it is constructed. So initially you take an array of size 2 into LLC, then you reduce it to a conflict set. So conflict set is basically a set of lines which cover the entire LLC. So uh, after converting to a conflict set, you convert the conflict set to an eviction set. So the eviction set is, eviction set, is a set of lines known to the attacker which map to the same set. So basically you are splitting conflict set into a group of uh, addresses which are mapped to the same set. So we need an eviction set here because uh, the LLC is very large and uh, time to probe the entire LLC will be very high, uh, which won't be useful for an attacker. Uh, so that's the reason we use it. Uh, so this is just an animation. Uh, so another reason why uh, we use uh, this eviction set is because uh, uh, the LLC is uh, split into slices and uh, uh, by using this eviction set concept, we can, uh, we can completely avoid the avoid thinking about slices and directly just focus on the set number alone. And here, uh, since we use uh, large pages, uh, because of which uh, if we have few addresses, we can figure out if they'll uh, go into the same set or not. So that is the use of an eviction set. So here's just a small animation uh, showing uh, how the eviction set is constructed. We have the LLC, we take an array of size 2 into LLC. We reduce it to a conflict set and we convert it into uh, a good set of eviction sets. So now we we'll look into the actual code. Hey, the... Raji, I have a question. Yes. In the previous slide, uh, wh why did you pick a array size which is twice of the size of LLC? LLC just to make sure that uh, we fill the entire. Uh, suppose it's just exactly equal to LLC. It is possible that uh, uh, we might evict the same line or something. Same, we, we might evict the already existing line which we put just before, so we might not be able to cover the entire LLC. But if we have two into LLC, then we will be able to cover the entire LLC at some point. Okay. So uh, now we'll construct conflict and eviction sets. Uh, we'll see the algorithm behind it. So initially we randomize the lines. Uh, then we have... Uh, so we create an initial array called conflict set which is empty. So here the probe function, what it does is, uh, first it reads the candidate into the LLC, uh, then it reads the conflict set. Now it checks if uh, the candidate has been replaced by the LLC or not. Uh, if it is replaced, then the output here is shown as yes, else it is shown as no. So what we do is all the lines after, which are not replaced, which after uh, reading the conflict set are put into the conflict set. So by doing this again and again, we'll be able to construct uh, an entire uh, conflict set, which is whose size is equal to LLC. So once that is done, uh, our, our main goal is to construct the eviction set from that. So 
uh, to construct the eviction set, uh, now, now we have two sets, which are which is uh, the eviction set. Uh, so, so we have two sets now, one which is a conflict set and the set of lines which are not part of the conflict set, but were originally part of the uh, array, which is array of size 2 into LC. So what we do is we take uh, one particular line from uh, the set not uh, set not in the conflict set, the line not in the conflict set and uh, Hey Rajiv, yes, sir. Yes, uh, sorry to uh, bug you in the middle. Do you have set of animations that shows the steps? Otherwise, it it's uh, it's kind of difficult to you know. Uh, for this, to... no. This yeah, we, because this this is good enough for a paper, but not for a presentation. There's so much information in one slide. Okay. Right? And yeah, I, I can't see the fonts also. It's extremely small. Right. Okay. So maybe next time when you talk about an algorithm, right? Do uh, don't put a flow chart. It's good for a paper, but not for a presentation. Okay. Instead, you could have broken down the entire step into you know three sub steps, and you could have uh, taken a LLC, uh, you know, fixed size, and with animation you could have shown okay how to find the conflict set, how to find the eviction set, and blah blah blah. Yes, right. sir. Yeah, next time we'll. Yeah, because this is a bit theoretical, actually at a high level. Okay. So, so since this I'll just um, I'll give you a high level view of what is happening. So now we have the eviction sets. So the code channel is basically uh, communicating between the sender and receiver uh, without the like order, without the uh, user knowing it. So what happens is uh, the receiver has the eviction sets with him. So uh, sender also knows the eviction sets. So both sender and receiver agree upon uh, two sets, two eviction sets uh, called set one and set zero. So uh, what happens is uh, if the sender uh, reads a line from the set number one, then it gets put into the LLC. And when the, if the receiver is able to get a hit for that set number one, then it means it's one bit number one. Else it is bit number zero. If it is, if if the receiver gets a hit for uh, line zero, uh, so by doing this, the sender can send the receiver all the bits of uh, particular array. Here we have used uh, something called descend. So the descend can be sent from the center to receiver by doing this algorithm. So uh, by uh, using prime probe, we can obtain sensitive information from the victim. So here uh, we are showing an example of a sliding window exponentiation attack. So here again, I will give a very high view of what is going on. Uh, uh, so in sliding window exponentiation attack, uh, there is an optimization where uh, multipliers are stored uh, in a particular place. So just to avoid uh, computation during the algorithm execution. So what we do here is this is a statistical method. So first we need to know uh, which multipliers correspond to uh, which particular, uh, sorry, which lines correspond to which particular multiplier. So by uh, we also have access to the GNU library, GNU GPG library. So by repeated repetitive accessing, accessing a multiplier, uh, statistically we, we can label which particular lines correspond to which multiplier. But by doing this again and again, we can get clusters of lines uh, which correspond to each particular multiplier. And uh, so this is like a square and multiply algorithm. So R Rajiv, again you are actually teaching. You are not presenting. Do you have any animations that showcase this entire attack? Uh, no, sir. Yes. Yeah, then I, I would suggest move on because I, I don't think anyone will be able to understand anything. Okay. This is the last so limitations of the attack. So first of all, um, as I mentioned before about uh, the large spaces, so this attack depends on uh, usage of large spaces uh, to avoid uh, to bypass the slicing of LLC. Also, the to perform that uh, initial uh, understanding of which lines correspond to which multiplier, which we had done before, we need to know the knowledge of uh, we need to have the knowledge of the cryptographic algorithm to perform an attack. And while decrypting, if the victim changes, if the victim changes the key, we won't be able to figure out that the key has been changed. Hence, uh, the victim should use the same key uh, when the attacker decrypts the lines, so so that we get the actual key as intended. So. Additionally, uh, paper assumes it uses uh, we paper assumes that we need an inclusive cache setup, uh, but does not talk about exclusive or non-inclusive caches. So, and uh, the victim and the attacker should be co-resident in the same VM for the for the attack to take place. 
these are the limitations of this attack okay. yeah i have a logistical question so uh, do the group members looked at this slides or you just prepared on your own and no sir uh, parts of slides are prepared by each of us and put together but then finally you should have uh, looked at it right compared to last uh, presentations the presentation that we had on monday this actually below par right yeah yeah it, it seems like you haven't put uh, enough effort to get into the subtle issues and then uh, in terms of presentation also it was not providing you know good enough high level view so this flow chart was the problem mm. Yeah, but anyway, it, it, it's uh, you know, but it, it's still below par. Yes. A any questions? I don't have many questions because I was expecting a better presentation. There are many things that uh, you didn't explain or you didn't talk about. So yeah, I, I will. Uh, yeah, so I, I will uh, check if others have any questions. Students. Rajiv, can you go to slide number twenty-three? It talks about limitations. Yeah, so uh, the limitation that the knowledge of cryptography algorithm is required beforehand. Uh, yeah. That's a general assumption, right? For an attacker and for a, a victim, uh, both uh, both know the cryptographic algorithm. Both actually know the uh, means the address space of the algorithm. Yeah, yeah, that's an assumption, right? Is that actually a limitation? Mm. Yeah, the knowledge is required. So. Uh, it is an assumption which we make just like uh, this inclusive cache so yeah we thought it could be a limitation okay no i was wanting to understand why you to uh, told about it as limitation because i am very new to all these uh, attacks so that's okay. why and another thing i wanted to ask is the victim uses the same key uh, to decrypt multiple times uh, probably i think the attacks are waste if victim changes the keys right and uh, one of the ways of actually overcoming all all these attacks is uh, periodically change the keys before a victim can uh, before an attacker can actually yeah. get the keys right mm -hmm. yeah, yeah but uh, thing is uh, while decrypting uh, the attacker won't be able to know that the key has been changed so that's why we say that the victim should use the same key fair enough fair enough fair. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah and the next point right the paper assumes an inclusive cache that's fine uh, but then why do you think in exclusive there can be an attack because if suppose let us assume that the victim is using the key presently uh, i would assume that that will be in its private cache right so we would we wouldn't be essentially bothered about uh, uh, the shared memory here because the key would be in the private cache rather than the shared memory no, the so, key will so, be in the private cache but uh, uh, while performing a computation the uh, the library used it its lines are in the llc right so for example uh, there is a key to to perform sometimes you have to do square sometimes you have to do square and multiply yeah. uh, so uh, while doing a square a set of lines are accessed while doing square and multiply a set of lines are accessed so that is why, why I, we why i am asking this is uh, why i am asking this is because uh, for algorithms like aes and rsa i don't but i am not particularly sure you are a better person to tell me are their code snippets so big that they can't be stored inside an l2 or an l1 cache private cache are their code snippets so big uh, so just asking for information because i am not aware of that <laughs> i'm not aware of that so what you are saying is that there will be a visibility problem essentially right that you won't reach the lc and this is discussed in the paper as well and that is exactly why you need an inclusive cache we can't so, be sure that we will need to hit the lc but it is possible that some parts for okay. rsa or es will hit the lc so the thing is if it is there in the lc even if you get it a hit in l1 or l2 it is fine because it's uh, so if, it, if we get a hit in a hit in l1 or l2 it uh, means that it is there in lc So uh, I'm just trying to critically review this paper from the perspective that uh, see attacks uh, these attacks are quite possible when you have an inclusive cache. So are the authors uh, trying to uh, for for the means for the because they want to publish this idea? Are they coming up with a, a very uh, comfort uh, means the simulation environment that is conducive for them to create an attack? So if at all if it's an exclusive cache, do you think these attacks can actually happen? The exclusive cache. What could happen is uh, 
the line could be there in the L1, and uh, while probing, you could just get a hit in L1, and uh, the probe result may not be correct for us. So it may, it's, uh, we, we won't even go till LLC. That could okay. be a possibility. Okay. But in case of inclusive, uh, if it, it is if, a, if it is a hit in L1, we can be sure that it is there in LLC. Yeah. And yeah, if it is a true. miss in L1, so it will automatically go to LLC. Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah. Uh, so that is the uh, assumption. Yeah. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so, Rajiv, uh, I have a question uh, like the large page, uh, pages to bypass the slice level mapping. So, what is the page size they have used? And in this, 2 MB for large pages. Okay. So, I have another question like you have uh, this is an attacker and victim, they are sharing uh, the space. Now, if a, another processor or in a, another any other core mm -hmm. accesses that that region or that shared region, there will be noise added to that, right? So that noise there, any, anything uh, on that? Yeah, so the noise is possible. Uh, so that's why uh, uh, all these attacks are like statistical in nature. So uh, we just... Uh, what do you mean by statistical here? Statistical as in uh, to figure out which lines are uh, like in that... Uh, the sliding window protocol uh, to figure out uh, which multiplier corresponds to which lines. We run it multiple times and see statistically uh, which lines correspond to that multiplier and we try to hit those lines alone. So probably. Oh, but, but in private probe, you don't have access to those lines. Which lines? The lines that you are referring mm -hmm. for, for uh, sliding window algorithm. In a yes. prime and probe attack, uh, you don't have direct access to those lines from an attacker point of view. Like we have the eviction set, right? so we can. Yeah, so build. that's what that's what uh, Brokas was asking. So if you have an eviction set, and uh, in a multi-core system, there can be other processes co-running along with your attacker and victim, right? Right. So how can you ensure? Or how can you give a guarantee that? When you evict a block, that block was actually part of your sliding window and that was part of the victim uh, accesses and not from some other core any process. So we, uh, can, we can, can have to run it multiple times and uh, see most possible value. Which is, and the attack is vulnerable actually to noise, but if you look, uh, if you could just go one side back. So, for example, in this uh, at the top of the second half, you can see that we are grouping similar trace patterns. What do you mean by top of the second up? I, I uh, can't the fourth it. green rectangle. Uh, so basically what we're doing is, for example, this is the sliding window expon exponenti exponentiation attack. And what we're doing is we're grouping similar trace patterns together using a clustering algorithm. So we have a variety of, like, we have several trace patterns. We Actually what we do is we trace all trace patterns simultaneously. And then based on statistical measures, we remove the redundant ones. And then once we have like only sets of temporal like trace patterns which are relevant, we cluster them together. And then after we cluster them together, together we denoise them. So there will in fact be noise, but we have mechanisms to deal with that noise. And that is the that is where the statistical insights come in and those sort of things. Yeah. Mm, I am not that convinced. So my, my concern is pretty trivial. Mm -hmm. So let's say set number one is the eviction set. Okay. And uh, let's say I have a 16 core system mm -hmm. and along with the attacker and victim, there are uh, 14 more co-running processes mm -hmm. that are accessing set number one. Mm -hmm. Possible, right? We are using huge page 2 MB. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So then uh, how are you ensuring that a, a particular LLC set that has only 16 lines Mm -hmm. And when you evict something and you are trying to correlate with, you know, the final sliding window access patterns, uh, what's the guarantee that the evictions are actually correlated with the access patterns? It may be complete noise induced by the co-running application all the time. Even if you do it billions of times, if uh, all the time you do your analysis, if co-running applications are live, then uh, eventually you will get more or less the same output, right? For this, uh, we can run the attack multiple times and uh, we can kind of make a histogram and uh, uh, and see which values are get uh, histogram for different key values and see which is the highest uh, value which we get and that could be the answer. No, even if you run the histogram multiple times, I, I can give you another point, right? 
let's assume uh, you you run your histogram billion times right so in all those billion times uh, i can also assume that the uh, you know that there are co-running processes that are accessing set number 1 it's highly possible right uh, moreover there there is there is there are some final points with this for example with like the attack that is in front of us so what we can do is we can time uh, the attack so like to in fact uh, if i could directly quote from the paper what we can do is that uh, we can use information that is obtained from the cache set which contains the multiplication code that the gnu pg code which we know what will happen when we will exponentiate or when we will multiply right and then we can check for activity in the scanned cache set the one that is under contention about whether this is say a trace pattern corresponding to this algorithm or not and then based on using the original multiplication code set as a clock we can time and we can measure exactly if the access is happening corresponding to this set so that is also a measure in which so actually noise is a significant problem in this attack but they have significant like special measures to remove the noise including actually manually sorting through clusters so uh, this thing should have been in your presentation uh, this right. is part of this uh, actually uh, the fact that we did not go to the first chapter since it was not uh, working out, so. okay any more questions uh hello so <clears throat> regarding the earlier question uh, like can we try like uh, instead of measuring the attack like, total probe time uh, we can like um, uh, uh, measure uh, for individual loads like uh, probing yes, time yes, to yes, reduce the noise yes that is done and that is in fact uh, suggested in the paper as well and the only downside is that it reduces the speed of that so it uh, yeah. okay with that and like yeah i didn't quite get the utilization of large pages actually so uh, please elaborate uh, so uh, what happens is uh, the llc is uh, uh, physically indexed so for first you have to convert the virtual address to physical address before you put it into the llc uh, so what happens is if you are uh, so in in you in uh, virtual address i mean in addresses you have virtual address you have uh, page number then page offset right so in cache you have tag uh, index and then offset within that uh, line cache line so uh, what have, what could happen if we have a small page what could happen is uh, that uh, that tag uh, that uh, virtual address could be a, the, the set index could be affected by the uh, page number Uh, so while uh, mapping uh, the we, the the set number is not controlled by us whereas uh, the offset we can control so when we have a large huge page the the page the set index will come within the uh, page offset so uh, by doing that we will be able to know which addresses will come in a particular set so that is the use of uh, this huge page large pages Okay, thank you. Yeah, you, you can look at the slides that we have already discussed a uh, few weeks back, even the video. So basically, uh, you are making sure that the index bits are unaffected by the address translation from virtual to physical address. Yes. So th that's the long story short answer. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hi. so uh, while forming the uh, conflict set or eviction set that time also uh, the noise issue will be there right because you wouldn't know if the uh, if any particular line was evicted because because of elements of your array or because of some other processes mm, yeah that could be possible noise is there no rajiv uh, actually the right approach is when you create the conflict set or eviction set you are the only process that is running on the system okay so uh, is that clear so whoever was asking yes uh, tejeshwar here sir yeah got yeah, it yeah yeah so uh, basically this is a pre attack step okay so okay it's like you know the victim is not running there are no co, -co running applications and that attacker has the access to the system so attacker can you know play with the system and try to find out what is the conflict set and eviction set okay 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 right once it is clear then uh, you can use that information for rest of the you know 
attack step or uh, rest, rest of the experiments that you want to uh, measure, deduce, whatever, right? Okay, so can we say that step is some kind of reverse engineering where we are trying to find out which lines are mapping to which side? No, that is not needed all the time, right? If you are using huge page, uh, you have to just, uh, the example that Rajiv was showing, you have a large array and by probing that large array, you are trying to find out which are the addresses which are mapped to the same set. Okay, okay. So that is the final definition of eviction set, right? And if you are the only process running on a multi-core system, there is no noise. After, you know, uh, one round of uh, iteration, iterating over all these addresses, finally you will be able to get a sequence of addresses which are mapped to the same set, which is known as the eviction set. Okay, okay, understood. Okay, any other questions, queries? Okay, I guess not. So, okay, thanks Raji, but uh, make sure next next time your group does a better job. Okay, do yes. it below. Okay, who is next? There was this. Second, just a second. Uh, sir, it's team number two. Team with IG two. Yeah, who is presenting? Uh, hello. Yes, I'm team number two. I'll present. Uh, so I'll uh, use uh, this only because PowerPoint, uh, Microsoft PowerPoint has some issues with animation. Uh, I'll restore my version for Monday, Jan 31st. Okay, fair enough. Uh, hello, all. I am Nain Bharate. We are from Misfits, and the paper I'm going to present is Streamline, a fast flushless cache covert channel attack by enabling asynchronous collusion. So, like, I'll just go through two slides. That's the basic. So uh, what cache covert channel attacks are? So we have two processes, and one is running on core zero and one on core one. They can't communicate directly, so they use the hardware. That's uh, they use some hardware to communicate. So core zero will uh, uh, encode the data that's ones and zeros into some forms of hits and misses, and then core one uh, will decode those hits and misses into the data. So uh, let's see flush and zero that's existing cache code channel attack. So uh, for sender, for every bit, uh, for if, if the bit is zero, it will load the data and wait. Whereas receiver, it will uh, load date and check the latency. So if it's uh, and threshold it, so it will be either hit or miss and then flush out, flush it out and then wait uh, and then they synchronize again. So it's a synchronous operation and since it's using uh, so, since it's a synchronous operation, it's limited by speed of 500 kbps. And we can see that receiver requires a usage of CL flush instruction. Um, the problem here is that few ISAs have CL flush in their privilege mode. So, uh, this type of attack is not allowed there. So, now I'll give a brief overview of what Streamline is. So, here I have cache that's uh, six blocks. And sender and receiver have agreed on that uh, this is my. A shared address space. So, what sender will do is, if he if he wants to send a bit zero, it will load load the address space, uh, and sender is in asynchronous mode. So now the receiver will load it, and it will get a hit. So it will decode it as zero. Uh, similarly, if a sender wants to send one, it won't access. So when the receiver accesses it, it would incur a miss, and it would be decoded as one. Similarly, like if it's a zero, then it would uh, the sender would load it into the cache links and the receiver would get a hit. Similarly, like this. Now, uh, the, point, the main point to note here is that uh, the address space that we have, it's, it's shared. 
and uh, it's repeating. So um, it's a self evicting cache searching access pattern. So by the time the sender has wrapped around, uh, the further block would have been evicted because we are op the array space is much larger than the cache size. So uh, here, the bit rate entirely depends on the load execution stage because since it's an asynchronous operation, the sender is uh, operating independently. Um, so sender, when it's sending data, it's either loading or it's not loading. So the bit rate is entirely dependent only on the load latency. And uh, in this uh, attack, in this type of uh, attack, we are not using flush at all. So uh, here we are we are using only the basic properties of cache. Uh, so it's applicable for all the ISAs. So uh, let's see the few challenges that we have in Streamline. First, uh, rate matching between sender and receiver. So here, what could happen is that um, since send, uh, our access pattern is miss and low, uh, miss and hit, if we incur, uh, if if sender incurs lots of misses, then receiver will incur lots of hits. So it could happen that the receiver. Um, uh, goes forward in sender and it will decode everything to be zero. So we don't want that. We also want that there should be a bounded gap between sender and receiver. And we want that gap to be less than, uh, like it should be less than the cache size. Okay, so second challenge that uh, that we face here is the prefetcher. So our entire um, algorithm is basically if the block is in cache or not. If our access pattern uh, is sensed by the prefetcher, um, it could prefetch the blocks and the receiver will um, decode them as zeros. So we need to fool the prefetcher and we also need to fool the cache replacement policy. So it could happen that um, after sender has sent the data and before the receiver is receiving the data, due to some other process or maybe because of our access pattern, um, it could evict some of the process, some of the blocks. And when the receiver receive, uh, access a bit, it would incur a miss. So, uh, to summarize, we need the sender and receiver to go in the same at the same rate. We want the sender and receiver to have a bounded gap. We want to fool the prefetcher and we want to fool the cache replacement policy. So let's address it one by one. Um, here I have made a hey, mistake. Hey, Nayan. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question. Go back. Yes. In the first point, why is it a challenge? Uh, sender and receiver should be uh, running at the same speed. So, so if a sender is is at a, operating at a higher speed than the receiver, and they are uh, uh, mapping to the same cache, right? So, um, we have uh, uh, this attack is like a FIFO. The sender is putting data into the FIFO that's cache, and the receiver is uh, removing data from the FIFO. Got it, got it, got it. But, but my understanding is in a covert channel, both sender and uh, okay, 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 I got it. So, yeah, they don't have any way through which they can communicate that okay, this will be my frequency or this will be my yes, speed. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah, got it, got it. Okay, yeah. So the cache is limited, so we need uh, some bounded in this. Yeah, yeah, got it, got it. Mm -hmm. So uh, here I've made a mistake. Uh, this one should be zero and this zero should be one. I'm sorry for that. So, okay, so if we want to send a bit zero, the sender will get a LSA miss and the ECO will get a LSA hit. Uh, if you want to transmit a bit one, the sender won't do anything, whereas the receiver will get LSA miss. So, um, if the uh, if the access pattern is such that there are lots of bits of ones, then the sender won't do anything. Uh, like sender will uh, operate at normal speed, like it's it, it will move on to next bit again again. But receiver will move at a slower speed because it's incurring lots of misses. Okay, so to avoid this, we want um, we want that the number of ones and number of zeros to be same. Uh, now we can't have a payload that always has number of bits to be same. So what do we do is we XOR the payload bit with uh, pseudo random number generator of different distributions from the payload bit. So uh, if you want to transmit a PBI, I'll I'll um, XOR with PRNG, and to decode it, I'll XOR it again to get the, my payload bit. Okay. So in a realistic scenario, uh, it it will always happen that the sender and receiver will have a non-zero diff. Okay. So we Incorporated uh, closely. So here we uh, the sender is agreed upon that after sending a fixed number of bit, uh, we'll synchronize using a separate low bandwidth core channel attack. Okay. So in this graph, the uh, red one is my uh, is without core without core synchronization, and blue is with synchronization. So they have agreed upon that after 200k bits, we'll synchronize. 
So after sending a first 200 bits, they synchronize and the gap will be zero. Then again, after 200 bits, uh, it reached to some point, uh, it's reached some gap, and we have synchronized it again. So here, uh, one thing is that uh, since sender and receiver um, are operating asynchronously, uh, sender, uh, so we want the sender and receiver to move it the same way. That means uh, we want them uh, like to have same number of instructions. So uh, I'll show it in future uh, in future slides that why there is a difference, like why we're adding RDTSTP, it's in future slides. So uh, we are now fooling the prefetcher. So um, the author said that if you access third cache length within a page with two pages accessed at a time, uh, it fools the prefetcher on 99.5% of the time. The author uh, did experiments with a uh, variable, like uh, they said X is cache line with uh, Y pages at a time, and they made a matrix and found out that using X equals three and Y is equal to two, we are able to fool the prefetcher very nicely. So uh, what will happen is we will go with cache line zero here, uh, we'll access it, then we'll go move on to cache line three, cache line six. So uh, we can clearly see that our uh, shared address space is actually covering one third of the LLC. Uh, the reason why we are able to fool the P feature is because uh, is what the author claims that the site tracking mechanism operates as a page granularity. Since we are accessing two pages at a time, it's able to fool uh, the P feature. And yeah, since we are operating, uh, we are accessing every third cache line, the pattern covers one third of the LLC search. Now, fooling the cache replacement policy. So um, let's first see what the cache replacement policy are. This has already been presented by uh, the first two presentations. So uh, reiterating, uh, we, uh, the uh, in every cache link, we have a two bit age values. If we get a hit, we decrement it till it saturates at zero. If you want to evict a set, uh, H3 set will be evicted. If there are no H3 sets, we'll increment every uh, cache link till we get an H3 set. So uh, to, uh, fool the to fool the cache replacement policy, what we do is key, uh, I have some bits that uh, in, in sequence like this, and this is my 5000th bit. So what we do is if I want to send this, I move my 5,000 bits and see if this thing is one. So if it is, oh sorry, if it is zero, if it is zero, I load it again. Okay, so when I'm sending this one, I'll go 5,000 bits back, check if this is zero, I'll load it again. So now when I'm loading this, it's age line will decrement and it won't be evicted. So moving on, if I'm sending this bit, I'll check if this bit is zero. It's not zero, so I won't load it. Next bit, uh, I'm sending this bit, 5,000 bits back, it's a zero, I load it again. Similarly, here I won't load it. Okay, so this is the overall algorithm for streamline. Um, here, the sender, it adds a RTTSCP instruction here, uh, this, and if the bit is here, it's loaded again. Uh, the one reason why RTTSCP is included here is because if there are lots of zeros, we'll get load, 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 and it could happen that the processor will issue multiple loads in parallel which we don't want because we don't know how to measure uh, load uh, latencies if we are issuing multiple latencies. So uh, to serialize it, we add a RTA TSCP instruction. We uh, put a, uh, we check 5,000 bits back. If it's a zero, we load it again to fool the cache replacement policy. And after sending uh, 200 K bits, we synchronize with the receiver. Similarly for receiver, we give it a, we uh, so hold the receiver for sometimes because we want the sender to be front of receiver. And then for, we iterate over all the issuing bits. We measure its latency, do thresholding, and uh, after receiving 195k bits, we wait for the synchronization. So uh, let's see some results. So here um, we are increasing a payload with bit rate on the left y-axis and bit error rate on the right y-axis. We can see that as the payload increases, the bit rate uh, as a general trend of decreasing. This is because um, as uh, for lower payloads, we are uh, we are not able to fool the ca uh, cache cache policy very well. So uh, as the payload increases, it uh, the bit error rate decreases. The author mm, divided this bit error rate into two. So that's when one flips to zero or zero flips to one. So uh, let's focus on one to zero. So receiver uh, receiver received zero, but it actually needed to receive uh, one. So receiving one means uh, that it should have incurred a uh, it should have incurred a miss, but zero means uh, it incurred a hit. This is because that the DRAM uh, when we are accessing uh, the DRAM, it actually gave the result fast. So uh, because of we are thresholding it, we incurred we read it as zero. 
uh, and rate zero, uh, zero to one flip. So zero means that the receiver should have got a hit. Okay, but it actually got a uh, miss. This is because the block got evicted because of some random, uh, some some other person running in background, or because we couldn't fool the replacement policy well. Okay, so uh, yeah, zero to one is because I disavowed from the LSE before the receiver access it, and one to zero is because DM access uh, is faster than the LSE hit threshold. Lastly, uh, the author highlights the measurement bottleneck uh, as a sender. Uh, we have RDT SCP load RDT SCP. So because of this serialization, uh, the, it uh, limits the bit period. Uh, the author claims that if we could resolve this uh, bottleneck, the it would lead to 10x increment in bit rate. And if uh, we study that the if system noise, so we have a co-learning processes, and we have we are doing our attack. So uh, because of co-learning processes, our cache uh, sets could be evicted. Okay. Um, so in order to the uh, in order to work around this, we could reduce the synchronization period. That's the gap between the sender and receiver. So if if a sender and receiver are close by. Uh, uh, the it's less likely that the blocks will be uh, evicted, but that also means that uh, we are losing the asynchronous uh, nature of our attack. We are moving closer and closer to uh, synchronous, uh, synchronous attack as we reduce the sync period. There will be more and more um, communication on the low bandwidth covert attack, a uh, covert channel that we are using for synchronization. So streamline achieves noise resistance by limiting the time window. Um, the author compared streamline with uh, other attacks, and we can see that the streamline achieved around 1800 uh, kbps. And whereas takeaway state of the state, state of the art uh, covert channel attack received uh, uh, achieved around 600 kbps. This is because uh, yeah, all, all of these use flush, and also they are synchronous in nature. That after sending one bit period, they wait again for sending another period till the receiver receives it. Whereas streamline is being asynchronous nature and being flushless, it's able to achieve uh, more about three times increase in uh, bit rate. So these are the results. Like a streamline achieves a bit rate of 18, uh, 1801 kbps with a bit error rate of 0 0.37%. That's higher than 3x. Uh, that's 3x higher than the previous attack. Um, we, uh, we could reduce this uh, bit error rate using some error correction codes. Um, we are able to use this error correction codes because um, this 1 to 0 errors, that's DM access is faster than LC hits. It's, uh, it will observe that this errors are actually um, single errors, like single bit flips, and they are uh, randomly uh, randomly distributed. So uh, if you use error correcting codes, it could uh, remove the single bit errors, and the bit error could be reduced uh, to 0.12%. And uh, the access pattern that we used deceived the prefetcher 99.5% of the times. So what are the mitigation strategies of the attack? There are three approaches. One is detection-based approaches in which we profile the attack using some performance counter or specialized hardware. But uh, this uh, this type of uh, approach is uh, less fruitful because we are uh, actually accessing just a shared space. We are accessing the array again and again. This could have been done by any memory intensive workloads. So uh, the author said that this, uh, this type of detection won't be very fruitful in uh, detecting streamline. Uh, for noise injection, um, if we, have, if we run a co-learning process parallel to this attack that uh, dislodges the uh, shared, uh, dislodges the sets from cache, um, the receiver would uh, incur zeros and like it will misinterpret the data. And isolation that will run the process in, so will partition the cache, will different trust domains from, uh, will prevent different trust domain processes from sharing caches. Including, um, a streamline is a flushless attack that exploits only generic cache properties. Streamline achieved a bit rate of 1800. And also this paper highlighted a new board measure bottleneck that is the in, our inability to measure latency of multiple loads in parallel. Uh, we saw that while sending, we added a RT, RDT SCP instruction just to uh, avoid this, uh, avoid to avoid the process from sending uh, multiple loads in parallel. Uh, thank you. That's, that's all from my side. Are there any questions? Yeah, nine. Could you switch on your camera? Oh, sorry, sir. Yes, yes. I'll... Yeah, we should know who is nine before the end of semester, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. 
Yeah, so I have a question on the prefetching part. Yes, they, they said that uh, since we are creating, uh, you know, deltas or strides of uh, length three and then across two different pages, that's why prefetcher is getting fooled if it, it's yes, unable sir. to learn it. So, uh, where exactly this prefetcher reside? Is it the L1 prefetcher or L2 prefetcher? Uh, it's the LLC. We are uh, what, no, operating in on the LLC. LLC. There is no prefetcher. Uh, oh. Could you check it again? Oh. Yeah, modern processors they use prefetcher at L1 and L2. Uh, so, so stride I, prefetchers are mostly there in L2. Uh, if you are talking about Intel processors. Uh, so I'm not sure. I I need to check it again. Uh. Yeah, because the first point is kind of flawed because L1 prefetcher they actually do cross page prefetching. So the L1 okay. prefetcher will be able to learn this access pattern. Even the modern processor, I'm not talking about a new prefetcher. Even uh, if you run uh, array with, uh, you know, these the offsets, three offsets uh, or distance three, but but spanning across two pages, the L1 prefetcher will be able to catch it. OK. So that's why I asked whether it's L1 or L2. L2 it won't be, but L1 it will be. Sorry, sir, I missed this detail in paper. I'll uh, I'll follow yeah, up. Check on it, Piazza. check it, yeah, check it, and I'll update, yeah. Yes, I'll follow up this question on Piazza. And then the, another question on the noise part, noise from the core running applications. Yes, sir. Uh, you showed a plot, right? Yeah, this yes. one, I guess, right? Yes. So. Uh, what is the intensity of noise? How bad was the noise? Intensity mm -hmm. meaning uh, so again, if I have a 16 core system, how many noisy processes were co-running along with your attacker or along no. with the yeah, spy? Uh, there are, these are uh, memory intensive workloads. Right? So they that are I got it that I got it, uh, but how many of them were running together? Uh. I'm not sure, sir. I'll yeah, because if it is a 16 core system, you are just uh, running one more process. It's not a big deal. Okay. Yeah, you, hmm. you need to think about all this, right? Because uh, modern systems are multi core systems. So unless they run similar copies of the same benchmark across all the cores, because it, it's kind of uh, you know interesting that even with extreme noise, they were able to get high, uh, you know, bandwidth. Bandwidth with a one per sub one percent uh, bit error. Yeah, so the code is also there, right? I think the GitHub link is there. In yes, the sir. They have provided the GitHub link. Uh, I would say you can just run it on a laptop with uh, sixteen core running processes and see it. You have to just yes, uh, you know run this code along with uh, 16 uh, background process running on a 16 core or four core or eight core system whatever and see what whether uh, this plot uh, you know sustain uh, or it performs uh, similarly right yes sir. i'll follow up this one piazza so. okay sir, sure. uh, the authors in the paper have used a four core intel skylake cpu with an mb llc to uh, to carry out or carry on on their experiments OK, but even in four core, you can run four core running process, right? Right. Yes, yeah. yes. OK, other questions? So in one so, slide, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, thank you. So in the one page, you have shown the error. Uh, so that is you have uh, mentioned that DRAM is faster than yeah, yeah. So the one to zero errors DRAM access is faster than LLC hit result. Hmm. So like DRAM usually take uh, more time. Uh, so this this point, can you clarify that? Yeah, so um, what actually happens like uh, it, it, this was followed up on Piazza as well, like a few students that, uh, yeah, did the plots and we could see that there was uh, not a clear distinction. There were some accesses. If you check the plot right now, there are some DRAM accesses that were uh, like near um, hit region. Okay, like uh, even though it was hit, its latency was uh, even. Sorry, even if it was a miss, its latency was uh, say comparable to hit. Like, there, there's a plot uh, on Piazza. No, so I, I think you I think you are confusing. So, 
uh, the, the answer that you are planning to provide, maybe that's correct. But uh, what Prokash is asking is, uh, how how can the DRAM access latency is faster than the LLC hit, right? Okay. Yeah, uh, the reason uh, part reason could be like we have a low buffer in DRAM, right? So uh, yeah. if if we're accessing the contents from the low buffer again, it would uh, give the response immediately. Yes, and then I think uh, the threshold that you are using for differentiating between a LLC access and a DRAM access, it, it's not a you know binary threshold. It, it, mm. it uh, yeah, so it may happen that uh, a DRAM access is actually you know uh, faster or in terms of the threshold, it's actually not uh, part of the LLC mids, but in the, it, it's in the part of the LLC hit, right? So, yes, uh, Nayan, have they run these simulations in the uh, these are real, systems. real systems or is it on? These are, these are attacks. These are attacks, so these are all real systems. Okay, these are all real systems. No, why I ask this is because uh, we had uh, uh, now he just mentioned right the DRAM buff, uh, if the row buffer if you have a hit then basically its uh, latency is less than uh, LLC hit latency. No, not LLC hit, but but the latency will be you know the, the gap between uh, LLC hit and DRAM hit it, it may be skewed a bit. Okay. Yeah, but all these attack papers are on real system. Even the previous paper that Rajiv uh, presented, right? That is also on the real system. Yeah. On simulator, you will find 100% accuracy and super high uh, bit rate. There won't be any noise, right? <laughs> Hi, so uh, in one of the slides you mentioned that uh, this attack is of self-evicting nature uh, yes. towards the beginning. Yes, yes, I'll go to that side. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, what does this self-evicting pattern mean? Yeah. So um, so it, 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 the address space, the address, uh, the address that I'm accessing could uh, two entries of it could map to the same cache line. So like it would happen that the I element zero and I element hundred could map to the same cache line one. So when my sender is trying to send bit zero, uh, it will use cache line one, and when I'm sending the hundred bit, it will also use cache line one. So we are already thrashing it. Okay, okay, understood. And also like the array size is greater than the LC. Okay, so it's already uh, using the same. Uh, it like okay. Um, it's using the the few entries are mapped to the same place. So since the uh, array size is greater than LC, uh, we get a self acting cache touching pattern. Okay. Yeah, I, I have one uh, one more question. Is the sender it's a multi-threaded sender or it's a single process? Single thread, sir. Single process. Single thread. Well, why why not go for multi-threading? That will also affect the bandwidth, right? Uh, yes, so uh, like a uh, multi parallel streamlines using yes. two channels. We are building two streamline challenges ch channels. Yes. Uh, we, did did uh, they talk about that? No, no. Uh, they have talked only about single channel using streamline. Yeah, maybe this can be a course project. If yes, someone sir. is interested, because anyway, the code is there. You have to just play around with it. After your talk, I have like few other ideas on top of this paper, but yeah, maybe in the interest of time, you, you won't discuss it now. Maybe I'll I'll put my thoughts on Piaja. Yes. Okay. Any any other questions? Can you go to the slide where it was showing the zero to one error, one to zero errors? Oh yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Here we see that. Uh, for initial uh, first two cases, the zero to one error is much less than the one to zero, but suddenly the uh, side gets flipped for continuous duration. So, I mean, just wondering what can be the reason for uh, such a, I mean, uh, switch in the case. Just yeah, to... uh, actually, this point was, isn't very clear from the paper as well. So, in the paper, they said that they uh, in the paper they said they they said that the bit rate goes down because of the because we are able to pull the P Cache replacement policy feature right. well, but while explaining uh, these errors, they haven't justified why, in particular, this uh, DM access is faster for as the payload increases. 
so I'm also not sure about this. So what do you mean by payload? It's the number, uh, it's the of, number of bits, bits that we're trying to send. In one go? In one go. Uh, like, uh, that, that means more number of loads, right? Transmissions. Uh, like uh, if yeah, you want yeah. To, how 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 big of a message file I want to transmit? But but what exactly is the content of the message? It can be all zeros, all ones, or yeah. yeah. So we are ones. yes yes yes. So we are actually uh, exploring with a random number generator to give. Uh, 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 so that function. I got it, but but finally, what's the distribution? We don't know, right? Finally, as in like payload distribution or like the, the payload that distribution. Pay payload yeah. distribution. We don't know. Because if the error is going down, that means with a larger payload, uh, DRAM access is actually becoming slower. Yes. Mm. That can only happen if you are again switching from one page to another page. Yes. Yeah, if you have a payload size, which is yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's. Yes, exactly. So, so if, if you are, uh, you know, the working set or whatever you want to communicate, that that actually spans through multiple pages, right? The probability yes. of getting a row for hit rate goes down. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, that explains why. Yes, yes. Hi, Tejeshwar here. Uh, can you explain what is the relationship between the size of your array and the payload? Size of our array, yeah. So mm, size of our array, as in uh, you you want to the, say the shared addresses. Yeah, shared addresses. Uh, so basically, there is some uh, array which is yeah this one yeah. So there is a huge array which is like uh, the size of that array is more than LLC, right? And uh, both sender and receiver are accessing the same array. Uh, yes. And oh. based on hits and miss, uh, depending on that, they are sending the data. So, is there any relationship between how uh, what is the size of payload uh, to the size of array? Because I'm not able to understand uh, what do you mean by when you change the size of payload, what things will change in the actual attack or in the actual memory access pattern? So, when I'm changing payload, I'm changing number of bits. Changing number of bits, I'm not changing the array size. Array size is uh, is fixed for streamline. Okay, like when the plot was plotted, uh, the array size was fixed. Okay. Okay. No, Even but if, but the access pattern uh, is that the same? Uh, which access pattern? The the, the the load the, the the sequence of loads that you are generating based on the payload. Yeah. Uh, that will change, right? Let, let's say you are doing load to address X, load to address Y, load to address Z, right? No, but X Y Z being the array, it's the same, right? Uh, we are just iterating it again and again. That I got it, but but if you are uh, sending a bigger payload, that means you are playing around with a large set of addresses, which means a, a good fraction of the array, right? So essentially, when you say array, these are nothing but the addresses, right? Yes. So uh, if I if I want to correlate the payload the width with, with the you know possible addresses that the attacker is trying to access through these loads, uh, then uh, my, my hunch, I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm right or wrong, but my hunch is they are kind of directly correlated, right? If no, my, uh, no, okay. No, sir. Because the array is fixed. We are accessing the same shared memory again and again. Like if, if I have- That I got it, that nine. I got it. No, no, no. What I'm saying is, let's say my array size is 2 MB. Okay. Right? My cache line size is 64 bytes. Okay, so. Right. So now I will have thousands of lines, right? Yes. Yeah. So now what I'm saying is if my payload width is just let's say two bit. Hmm. So I will send two loads, right? Yes, sir. Exactly. So two loads meaning let's say load to address one, load to address two, or cast line one, cast line two. Now my payload is let's say uh, 1000 bits. Hmm. So I will do load cast line one, cast line two, cast line three like that for thousand cast lines, right? Yes, sir. So if I so that means if I am increasing my payload, I am covering a large fraction of my array in terms of sending the loads, right? Yes, sir. So so then that that kind of correlates with the you know uh, access patterns and the DRAM row for hit rate and blah blah blah. 
Yeah, so, but we need to fool the replacement policy, right? Replacement policy and prefetches. So, using lower payload doesn't make sense. Uh, like low. No, 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 that, that is okay. So, uh, we, we are not discussing about the prefetcher and replacement policy. The, the question that uh, Tejasu was asking, it was about the correlation between the payload and the actual array, uh, right? Yes, if sir. I'm yes, not sir. wrong. Yes, sir. That that correlation I wanted to. Yeah, understand. so the array is a constant. It's a 2 MB array or a 1 GB array, right? But uh, 1 GB array will be, you know, thou thousands of lines or millions of cast lines, right? Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So finally, again, uh, I haven't read the paper completely. I, I, I read it, you know, a year back. Uh, but my understanding is since you are increasing the payload, you can actually correlate with, you know, each payload bit as one cast line load, right? Yes. Okay, and so basically if you have whatever payload size is, that entire size will directly map to those many elements of array you have to go through, kind of. Exactly, exactly. And if if your payload is like more than array size, then you will basically... Uh, no, it is not from more than array size, right? It's not more than array size. It's okay because array is very huge. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I have no, one I'm more confused. <laughs> yes, sir, because <laughs> the array is fixed. If your payload is higher, we'll you again. We will use the shared memory again and again. Yeah, yeah, that's what we we are on the same page. Okay. Not uh, on the OS page, but <laughs> <laughs> array. Yeah. Array size and shared memory are two different things, right? Even if your array, your array is more than LLC size. So even if you access the whole array, like even if you go through whole array once, in that case also you will be re-accessing the shared memory in a, some kind of cyclic pattern only, right? Yes. Sir. See, Tejaswar, long story short. See, yeah. if I want to communicate, let's say one gigabits. Yeah. But my uh, array size is just let's say kilo cast lines. Yeah. Right. So what will I do? I will iterate over that same array again and again, thousand times. Okay. Yeah. Right. But if I want to transfer one thousand bits and my cast or my array is of thousand lines, then uh, I can easily create uh, a streamlined channel with one iteration itself. Right. Mm, okay. Okay. And. Uh, uh, how how are they ensuring that when we are accessing the same cache line again, uh, like let's say the you access some cache line for like uh, array element zero, and then let's say for like let's say thousand or five thousand uh, array element, you are accessing the same cache line. How are they ensuring that the previous uh, or that okay, this is different, so it will not get a hit. It will get a miss. Yeah, sorry. No, I was trying to understand would the self eviction you said, right? Yes. Self evicting cash uh, thrashing access pattern. If we have a as you said that's greater than cash, it will already it will thrash it easily, right? Yeah, it, able to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Able okay. to fool the replacement policy. Okay. What else? I have I have one question. Yeah, go on. Yeah, this is regarding the replacement policy. Which all replacement policies did they try to fool? Uh, the existing, the one that Intel uses. Uh, like what is? Oh, so did they reverse engineer it and then? Yeah, so they uh, they uh, referenced uh, they cited this uh, paper that uh, that uh, reverse engineered the uh, Intel replacement policy. The reload uh, repress attack paper. Yes. Oh, okay, okay, I get. Yes, yes, yes. They they have mentioned. Okay, okay. Yeah. The the aging wala replacement policy where it it actually correlates with RRIP policy. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. And what what do you mean by uh, fooling the prefetcher? Is it that prefetcher is not able to uh, fetch any block? No, if, like we if if I'm accessing CL zero, uh, if I'm accessing CL zero, CL one, CL two. And my uh, next bit that I want to send is CL3. Then prefetch will definitely uh, get CL3 because it's a single stride. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a predictable access pattern. Predictable yeah. access pattern. So we want to fool it because our whole algorithm depends on whether the block is in cache or not. 
you know that i got it i think yasika's question was what exactly you meant by fooling so the prefetcher is unable to fetch anything yeah if it's fetch prefetching then it should it, it, it shouldn't prefetch the one that we're interested in okay oh. okay 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 so you are just targeting a particular set at a time that this yes. in this set there should not be any noise apart from that anything can yeah. be there it shouldn't just prefetch that particular address block we were interested in like else it can prefetch anything Oh okay. Oh uh ha. -huh. This yeah. is subtle. Mm hmm hmm. Yes yes exactly because they are targeting just one set at a time because uh, that that is the kind of uh, bit that they want to transfer and after that they are not uh, worried about it like then prefetch I can prefetch. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Are we done? Yeah, seems like yeah, it was good uh, overall. You know, uh, based on the questions, you can expect, right? So it was good. Thank you. Sir. Okay, Devasis, you can start. I guess you can uh, stop the recording. Uh, sir, actually, team four want to present. <sighs> hmm. So then, what exactly you are planning for the demo? Sir, this was something that uh, I've got in the last moment. Actually, Ishit, can you say what you wanted to say? Hello, Ishit. Uh, hello, sir. But you, you guys should have coordinated before time, right? Why uh, every time it happens during the lecture slot? Okay. Anyway, so uh, you know you'll be running out of time, so uh, we can just ask the class, right? If if it is okay, we, we can let Ishit continue, and Deva says you will just record it and uh, put it on YouTube. Is that the uh, Protocol so it will it will barely take 10 10 minutes. So I don't. If everyone has class, then maybe I can record it, or maybe I can just continue after Ishit's presentation. Okay, okay. Maybe Ishit, uh, let's get started first. Then we'll see. Thank you, sir. And then next time, please inform before time. Uh, why why are you not informing before time? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, go on, go on. Uh, sir, uh, how to uh, should I just present? What else you want to do, <laughs> sir? Uh, I think uh, there is uh, per there is no permission. Okay, Devasis will provide. Wait just a second. Uh, sir, before starting the presentation, there is a reminder about uh, uh, points for writing reviews. Yeah, I guess no one has started. So th this is actually a, a proxy for uh, active participation. Because you guys are not participating, so at least you should write or you should comment about the reviews that uh, your friends have written. So I think everyone must have got an email from Hot CRP. Do that. Okay, Isit, are you ready? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, okay. can everyone see my uh, screen? I'm not sure about everyone, but I can see it. All right. Uh, sir, how much time uh, would I have? Come on, these logistics are already <laughs> 20 minutes. All right, all right, right? All right, it, it seems yeah. like, uh, yeah, go on. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, you have to go for full screen. Yeah. Yes, yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Ishit. I'm from team number four, Spectre Down. And uh, the paper I'm presenting today is Overcoming the Observer Effect uh, for Prime and Scope Algorithm. So, it is uh, an improvement over an already ex existing uh, uh, cache attack. It's called uh, the prime and probe attack. So this paper uh, suggests some uh, improvements in that regard, and it improves the algorithm in certain ways. It overcomes challenges. We'll discuss that. Structure of the presentation would be that first we'll start with introduction, then we'll uh, talk about cache attack from a thousand feet view. So uh, don't read we... it. It's okay. Anyway, you will come to it, right? So all right, all right. It. Yes. Yeah. So we that. come to cache attack a thousand feet view. So uh, to explain a cache attack, let's see uh, the analogy of an attacker uh, who's an ATM robber. So the goal is to get the ATM pin. So the old school method would be to just uh, persuasively request the ATM pin from the user itself, all right? Uh, so as to break the cryptographic code. But now cryptography has progressed a lot 
and uh, it is very difficult so it is like the victim has now bo uh, bodyguards so we need a better cleverer less violent method uh, and it is uh, the cash attack method right so for example what we can do is we first go to the atm and clean the number pad so it would uh, look like this and then we wait for the victim to use the atm and after that when he goes away then we look for his prints right so in this we can see that his prints were over the numbers 2 3 5 and 7 so we see that his pin must be composed of these numbers although we don't know the order we'll need other things also so this is how a cash attack works there are two phases a first one is the preparation phase the second one is the observation phase for prime and probing attacks uh, the preparation phase is called the prime phase the observation phase is called the probing phase and uh, uh, when we cleaned the keypad it was the prime phase and when we observed the prints of the user the atm user the victim it was the probing phase now we come to an overview of cash timing attacks so this is a graph and uh, it is from someone called dr henry wong from uh, university of toronto so i have a, a link to his blog you can go there if you want it's a good blog so he has shared uh, this graph and is uh, it demonstrates the uh, cash timings of uh, cash and memory right so the x axis is array size and the y axis is the access latency or the access time so as the access uh, array size increases the array cannot uh, fit on a higher level cache and it moves down uh, lower the lo lower and lower in the memory chain so initially the array is small it's in l1 cache access time is very less but when it moves into l2 cache th there is a very beautiful jump so it's it's almost precise jump of access time and similarly we see the jump when it moves to l3 and then there is a huge jump in access time when it moves to memory so if uh, this demonstrate that if we know the access time we can ve very accurately tell whether the data was accessed from l1 cache l2 cache l3 cache or from memory and for the past 15 years this information has been exploited to launch uh, sophisticated attacks one such attack is prime and probe attack so how does this work so the goal of a prime and probe attack is to identify the sets uh, with the which the victim is accessing uh, and this is uh, the image of a cache i think everyone knows it's a four way set associative cache and uh, every set has corresponding uh, memory elements which can come in the set so every element from the memory which can come into the set has uh, four options in this case uh, so this is to keep in mind now prime and probe attack how it uh, functions is during the prime phase we fill the cache with junk right uh, and then during the probe phase if the victim has act accessed some elements it would have uh, replaced those sets uh, with its own elements so when we again access our own junk blocks then they would take a higher time so we'd identify the sets that we victor victim has accessed it has not been very popular uh, we'll see why and that is why this paper which i am uh, uh, presenting uh, but a known improvement that has been used in this paper also was mentioned in a 2015 paper it was called the last level cache side channel attacks are practical it was the name of the paper and uh, it uh, basically said that you don't uh, prime and probe the whole cache only the target sets so it would be faster this has been used in uh, the paper that we would discuss so therefore we would only discuss about priming and probing only a set and not the whole cache so we come to the challenges that the authors of the paper mentioned yes, and they overcame hello yeah i said i have a question here yes sir uh go to previous slide yeah so the, in the prime probe uh, paper this 2015 paper that's what rajiv presented one hour before right yes, and he talked about the notion of conflict sets and eviction sets right yes sir yes, uh so uh, eventually that that boils down to few target sets right so is is, is it not enough uh no said that uh, reduction of target sets is uh, not enough because uh, we are uh, in this paper we are concerned about other things meaning other uh, things like meaning this paper we talk about probing improvements they have not uh, uh, you know Uh, uh how to say see even if uh, in the 2015 paper even if you reduce the amount of target sets but in order to probe them 
we still still need uh, the traditional prime and probe approach and in this paper they have uh, suggested a better approach so if okay okay hang on hang on hang on hang on you are saying now i will replace the probe phase of prime and probe with something which is better than probe is this yes, correct uh, yes okay. that that is the idea of the uh, okay, author okay. So we are improving the probe bandwidth or probe time. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go on. So the challenges uh, that I had mentioned, what the authors have overcome, uh, they basically there are three challenges. The first one is the observer effect. Uh, the second one is detecting contention, and the third one is improving temporal resolution. We will go over them one by one. Observer effect, uh, basically, if uh, we know about the heisenberg uncertainty principle it's basically the same thing that uh, for an electron we cannot know its uh, position and its momentum at the same time the reason is when we go to observe the electron we'll probably bombard it with the uh, photons or some other particles or maybe put it in a uh, field so these things would influence would interact with the electron itself so its state that was uh, all, uh, before would change so this is called observer effect and this works on cache also uh, because in order to probe the cache we need to access it and when we access it we change its state we change the least recently used uh, uh, line we change the most recently used line and in that way we may need to uh, pr do a prime uh, phase again so this is how it affects the cache also and they have overcome it we'll discuss how later now detecting contention uh, contention means uh, Uh, conflict for a resource all right so uh, when uh, a line in a cache is replaced it has four options for uh, in this four way set associative uh, cache it has four options in modern in i think intel processors it is a 12 way set associative cache so here it has four options but we do not know that which uh, one of the lines would be replaced so we have to check all of them so this takes a lot of time so this is another challenge now third is improving the temporal resolution in this figure that you see uh, it start initially with the prime phase the blue one and then we wait for some time it's called a window so we wait for some time then we do the brown phase called probe phase but uh, we do not detect anything because every, obviously no event has occurred uh, and in the next waiting phase as we move so uh, the victim accesses the cache so it, that is the first event that we observe uh, and we observe it in the pro phase next uh, the second pro phase after that we also have to do a prime phase uh, so we observe the first event but the next two events occur when we are in the prime phase and pro phase so they most probably we would miss because we would be busy with other things so these two things we missed after that uh, a window again arises the waiting phase and one event uh, occurs again and in the next uh, pro phase we'll uh, Uh, observe it but the middle two events we would probably miss so this is one thing now to improve this so that we do not miss events we can do one thing is we can in, uh, increase the waiting uh, period or the window size so now what happens uh, is that the initial phase is the prime phase then we have a huge waiting phase and in the end we have the pro phase so all the four uh, events are there and in this case we do not miss any but if uh, the victim had accessed the same uh, memory line then we won't be able to say that if there was four the number of uh, locations or uh, the number of accesses events happened we won't be able to tell because uh, we would only know of one event if it's the same line that was being accessed so this results in uh, what you call reduction huge reduction in temporal resolution so to so this is sort of a uh, moria ya anda sort of a problem that if we increase probing we probing and priming we miss a lot of events but if we increase the window size the temporal resolution massively reduces now uh, tackling the challenges how uh, the authors tackled these challenges all right so first problem was detecting contention so uh, what they said is uh, i think in the previous uh, presentations also it was mentioned that they have done it for intel so Uh, we already know the cache replacement policy of intel it has been uh, studied it has been reverse engineered it is basically a modified version of uh, least recently used so what we can do is when we are priming the system right 
the element that we least recently used we only check that okay uh, so we sort of plant a bad apple so we know that when the replacement would happen only this cache line would be replaced so this is called scope element so now we don't need to check other elements we only check this and how we uh, tell that which element would that be uh, for that we exploit the uh, cache replacement policy of the system we need to know that now second uh, problem was observer effect so uh, the problem with this that uh, with this was that in order to probe the system we affect the uh, system in order to probe the cache we effect if we probe the even the scope element then it won't it won't be remain the least recently used it would become the most recently used so it would not no longer be the eviction candidate so we may need to prime again but uh, they tackled this problem uh, because uh, modern systems have multi level cache so they uh, the higher level llc or maybe any higher level cache which is shared uh, between the attacker and the victim there is uh, the scope element and it is also obviously because intel is inclusive it is also present on the higher level cache uh, the l1 or l2 cache but when the attacker checks or probes for the scope element it's called scoping so it oh, he only checks it on the higher level cache but it uh, the request for access does not reach the llc so there it remains the least recently used and thus the uh, eviction candidate but on the higher level cache it is the most re uh, recently used and it won't be uh, executed so uh, they observe they overcome the observer challenge in this way now increase in the temporal resolution now because scoping at a higher uh, level of cache and only one element it is very fast so we almost have no misses and because Uh, there is no need uh, for window because we do we do not observe the high level cache so on the uh, we do not uh, observe the shared llc so on the higher level cache we can uh, uh, do as much probing as we want and we don't need uh, the window at all so summary of solution observe observer effect how we overcame is that we do not observe the target cache we only observe the higher level caches and the second uh, one which is cache contentions uh, how they overcome is that they exploit the uh, known uh, cache replacement policies to plant a scope element and the third is that all this obviously uh, re leads to increase in temporal res resolution uh, there's some performance comparison with some other strategies so for example it's the windowed version of uh, flush and reload and prime and probe the windowed version and we have the prime and scope uh, algorithm which is not windowed and uh, Uh, it uh, uh, certainly has a good uh, accuracy right from the start so if the window size keeps on increasing then flush and reload and prime and probe they uh, their miss rate reduces a lot so their accuracy uh, improves a lot uh, but uh, if you would remember when their accuracy increases uh, because of window size increase their temporal resolution is also uh, decreasing so that is the downside so this uh, uh, prime and scope is a good alternative to these uh, uh, strategies now limitations of the paper a few of the limitations of the paper is that the prime phase still takes a lot of time they have not uh, improved on the prime phase so that was already uh, a downside of this uh, approach uh, beforehand so the pro phase they worked a lot but the prime phase still takes a lot and the second one is that it cannot be implemented on the highest level cache so we at least need two levels of cache because we scope on the highest level of cache so we at least need two levels of cache it cannot be done on the highest level cache or if there is only one level of cache and the third one is that the re cache replacement policy must be known if we don't know then we cannot uh, put in the scope element uh, the fourth point is that actually we the cache replacement policy we reverse engineer and the companies also update their policies so cache replacement policies are quite complex and secretive and in specific situations uh, their behavior may not be as we expect so this may not be a perfect strategy and uh, the fifth point is similar the uh, authors they used uh, uh, the word optimal solution for uh, their this approach the scope element approach but optic optimal solution is i i don't think it's applicable because optimal is a scientific term and it means the best solution and uh, they did not offer any scientific proof for that 
and i i don't think it is the best best solution uh, because it may fail in specific areas and there may still be room for for improvement so thank this was my presentation uh, i'm ready for question so in your opinion uh, what should have been the defense for defending the optimal uh, the point on optimality uh, sir my my defense yeah so what what exactly the author should have done uh, to please you <laughs> sir i don't think that he should have used the term optimal he should not no, 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 this is, is not an optimal solution no no because, my, my uh, question sir, is different my question yeah. is different my question is if they have to use the word optimal <laughs> what are the kind of experiments they should have done to defend their uh, claim on optimality <laughs> sir i think there would there should have been um, probably a mathematical or some kind of proof uh, uh, that don't happen that, right uh, this, this is, is the best solution no that that that's not the best solution that is impractical solution yes sir we are working on systems right so in systems we don't have uh, mathematical proof for optimality sir but th this is, they have used it like a keyword you know that like a tag phrase so i i feel like they have used it to attract uh, more people towards their solution that, that's that's okay that, that's okay that can be one point of view but uh, you know uh, mathematical proof like what, what mathematical proof will provide what, what exactly will be the utility of that proof just to prove that uh, nothing better can be done for example sir the hang on hang on you, you are actually speaking so fast nothing better in terms of what uh, nothing better in terms of uh, uh, the uh, in scope what we do is we check for uh, uh, the what do you say hang uh, on check for... so when you say nothing better that that means there is a metric right you are saying okay in terms yes, of sir. this metric uh, yes sir i am saying i'm uh, saying sir i'll tell you see they have called it optimal in what way they have said that uh, uh, to uh, probe or to scope they need only one access mm -hmm. because they check only one element mm -hmm. okay but sir so, go it's on. not perfect because uh, it depends uh, if if it's just one element then we can call it optimal but uh, that depends on already knowing the cache replacement algorithm absolutely correctly but in real life applications it may not it may not work see hang on uh, i think for the problem that you have presented the optimal solution should take one access per probe or scope right yes sir so that's what it's doing so it's optimal sir so, but uh, there is no guarantee of success optimal means one access with the guarantee of success they are uh, achieving one no, access I, I, yeah i think we are but in a different say... zone no no we are in a different zone so the laptop that i am using now for watching your uh, presentation yes uh, that may fail in next 2 seconds right yes uh, but yeah the, the you know manufacturing companies they say uh, saying that okay you know the lifetime is you know huge the reliability is huge there is a non zero probability that it may fail but it's optimal Sir, but right, so. optimal is a scientific term, no? No, See, no, no, no. Or no. if the Dijkstra, if the algorithm. That's what I'm saying. Like... That's what I'm saying. That's the problem with our mindset in okay. systems research. Optimality is not about coming up with a bound or coming up with a proof. Okay. Right. By showing it, so they have done it on a real system, and they are yes. showing that okay, in a real system, we can do it in one probe or one scope, right? One yes, access. Sir, the performance improvements are obviously obvious. But yeah, there is no guarantee of success. No, no, we are not uh, dealing with guarantee. I think we are in a wrong course to deal with guarantees. <laughs> yeah, I think course on cryptography or any other theory course will be uh, much more appropriate for the statements. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I would request all of you to you know uh, flush out this mindset. This is kind of common in Indian academia. uh like it, it's not like it's a problem it just like you know systems research is done in a different way and uh, from our high school days we have been trained based on lemmas proof theorems bounds right uh, so uh, get out of that zone yes sir okay i think we are already running out of time any questions folks 
I had one. Like, can I ask or maybe I can contact Ishit later? But... Ask, don't wait. Okay, okay, sure, sure. So I um I did not get the temporal resolution. How will it decrease? What did you mean by the temporal uh, resolution? Temporal resolution means, see, uh, I'll just uh, get to the slide. Yeah. You can just brief the brown. The brown phases are the pro phases, right? Yeah. Now, in the prime and probe uh, uh, method or cache attack, uh, the pro phase takes a lot of time because we check uh, each and every uh, uh, cache line in the set. So, and also in the high, in a lower level cache. So, it takes a lot of time. So, we cannot repeat it. Right. We cannot keep on doing it. We have to wait because if we keep on doing it, then the event would happen while we are probing. But in uh, this scoping method, we just uh, uh, what what you say check in a higher level cache, and that also one element. So it's so quick that we can continuously uh, keep on doing it. And uh, uh, there's one more issue with the prime and probe is that if you do too much prime and too much probe then even the victim uh, process uh, slows down, the whole system slows down. It takes a lot of time because you are uh, flushing, basically clearing out the cache. So uh, that also happens. But uh, in prime and scope, because you are checking just one element and that also in a higher level cache, so it is so quick and you are not even touching the target cache. We don't touch that. So it is so quick that we can keep on doing it. So we uh, register more events. For example, here in the next slide, I think we got it. We we are yes. doing less, uh, you know, less probing in, uh, and then we are kind of agile. We are we are able to do yes. it fast. In the, in this, for example, we see four events, but we may not able to register all of them separately. No. But uh, for if the temporal resolution was higher, then we would have uh, noticed each of them separately with a probe uh, just next to them. So the we can probe very quickly and more number of times. That is why the temporal resolution is higher in uh, probe and scope. OK, OK. So uh, my point is that if uh, the attacker already knows about the algorithm and um, he the attacker knows that what is the frequency or maybe a, uh, in how many cycles there would be one occurrence to square or multiply um, part of the algorithm. So then he, uh, attacker can divide the time between certain in, in like in it, it can divide the time in some certain cycles right and then the attacker only needs to uh, probe in that in that particular interval time so why why is it why is there need to uh, frequently probing um, what is the need of frequent probing no because in this case the attacker actually does not know uh, uh, the uh, what what you say that when the victim would uh, do events maybe for one approach it would uh, work but uh, not in general approach so the algorithm that the authors have presented it does not uh, consider victims actions and does not uh, assume uh, anything so it keeps on probing and it registers uh, victims uh, uh, movements or what you can say events so it has yes, no information. It's, it's more robust, you know. It's not dependent on the victim's yes, access it's... pattern or dynamics, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So otherwise, you have to do it dynamically for each program. You have to tune your uh, temporal resolution, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Devasis. I, I think you can stop recording. It's one hour thirty minutes. Yes. Okay. I, I have another meeting.